So tonight we're looking at faith. The series that we're in is the key to releasing heaven on earth. And chapter 3 really talks about faith and God's promises. And I looked up the promises, and we're going to get into some of them in a little more in depth. But just to look at the slide up here, there are several things listed. You may not be able to read it too good there unless you have real young eyes. But uh, one of them says unconditional love. These are promises of God. Favor and wisdom and provision and strength and protection and peace and joy and victory. And so we know that God does give us promises. And I'm going to take us back through the Old Testament and then to the New Testament to look at these promises that God has given to us, His people. I also lit, looked up the seven promises, and we had authors that gave them two different ways, but we see I'm forgiven, I'm free, I have hope, I am gifted, I have a purpose, I am valuable, and I am blessed. And I think we could take that list and put it on our refrigerator and repeat it to ourselves every day. And if you've got teenage daughters especially, we could put that on the uh, mirrors and uh, everywhere that they are uh, use, using the home uh, and have them to read that every day, maybe several times a day until it resonates in their heart that they are uh, forgiven, free, and have a hope. They are gifted. They've got a purpose. They're valuable and they're blessed. And then this other writer said there are seven promises of God. He says, I will be with you. I will protect you. I will be your strength. I will answer you. I will provide for you. I will give you peace and I will always love you. So there are more than 14,000 promises in the Bible. And the good thing of it is, is that God has not broken a single one of them. Has somebody ever promised you something and they didn't come through? That's aggravating. That's aggravating. But when we read the promises in the book, we understand that every single promise that he has not broken them. For no matter how many promises God, or met, God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. So we learned in chapter 1 with Brother J.D., now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen in Hebrews 11 and 1. But another word for evidence is confidence. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the confidence of things not seen. So what kind of confidence do we have in the Lord? So that's really what we're talking about tonight. We're not talking about uh, confidence in our economy or our president or the Pope or anybody else that is in any position you can think of. We're talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so we have got something to put our hope in, our confidence. So Jim Cimbala said, faith, what is faith? It is total dependence on God that becomes supernatural in its working. People with faith develop a second kind of sight. They see more than just the circumstances. They see God right beside them. Well, can they prove it? No. But by faith, they know he's there. Faith alone is the trigger that releases driving power. So we know that as we are walking in faith, sometimes it almost feels tangibly that he is right there, that you can just feel him by your side. Time and time again, I explained to one of my grandchildren today, something fell through for him, and he was really frustrated and um, many emotions. And I told him, I said, well, if service hadn't have been canceled Sunday night, there's a good possibility Larry and I would have been in a wreck. There was a, a bad wreck on 42 right there by our subdivision. At the same time, Pastor, that we would have been turning in, coming home from church. And so I said, sometimes things work out for our good. I said, race that. 
God works all things out for our good. So when we are exercising faith, we just simply believe that whatever's happening, good, bad, or ugly, that God is working in that thing for our good. So faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. We know, we're convicted, we absolutely believe it. So faith activates the power and the promises of God's Word. Faith activates the power and the promises of God's Word. And so really, that's what this chapter is built on. The power, the promises of God's Word. And so faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. So when we believe what God promises... We'll see those promises fulfilled in our life. But if faith is absent, then God's word becomes ineffective. If faith is absent, it's just another book. It's just more words on a piece of paper. But if faith is present, have you ever had it where the words in the book come alive? They're powerful, more powerful, it says, than a two-edged sword. And so we know that we get convicting power through the Word, whether it's for salvation or whether it's for some bad attitude or action that maybe we did. But God uses the Word. But first, we have to have faith present. We have to believe in Him and that He is the Son of God. Amen? So in Hebrews 4, verse 2, For indeed... The gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Now faith sees what it believes as more real than what exists in the present. So let's just picture the promises of God being fulfilled in your life thinking about this verse. It was not mixed with faith. The word didn't profit them. It didn't give them what they were looking for. Why? Because faith was missing. Have you ever made a cake? We don't have too many ladies in here tonight, but have you ever made a cake and it just didn't turn out? I cooked some Congo bars down at my mother's house, and they were flat as could be. They didn't rise one bit. First time I'd ever cooked them. Well, if you know... Congo bar recipe, that's a lot of, I mean, nuts and chocolate chips and all that expensive stuff. But they didn't rise a bit. They were terrible. I dumped them in the trash can. And one of my brothers said, don't throw them things away. I can microwave that thing. It needed more than anything a microwave could do. But my point here is, this is the picture of a cake that fell after it was taken out of the oven. Profiting from God's word Mixing faith with God's Word. So you are saying, Sister Heron, are you telling me that faith is like a cake? Well, sort of. If you think about it, what's in the mix? What's in the mix? I can tell you that if you don't put some baking powder in that mix, you're going to have a flat mix. Found out Mama's flour was old. Us young'uns had done moved away, and she hadn't cooked like she had cooked before, and the flour had gone bad. And so that's why it didn't rise. So without that. And that's exactly what this scripture is trying to tell us on that previous slide. The word wasn't profiting them because it didn't mean anything to them. It wasn't active in their hearts and in their life because they had not activated faith. We have to mix a little bit of faith in there with the word and all of a sudden, it'll speak to us. It'll do the work that it's supposed to do. It will rise up in us and give us wisdom and give us strength and give us every single thing we need to make heaven our home. Amen? So let's do a character study right quick. Let's look at Abraham, the father of faith. He's referred to in the Bible 307 times. That's what the writer tells me. Now, I didn't go do the research on that, but uh, I was reading behind another author, 
and he said that it was mentioned 307 times. Basically, the only one that was mentioned more often was Moses. But Abraham's importance and his impact in redemptive history is clearly seen in Scripture. We meet him when he's 75 years of age. Beginning in Genesis 12, we see the call of Abraham by God. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. So we see that God promised him three things. A land of his own, to be made into a great nation. Now he's 75 years old. He don't have any children here. And the promise of a blessing. And so Genesis 15 and 17 are known as the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, there are lifelines of Abraham. He leaves Ur. He's called by God. He moves to Egypt. He receives the covenant from God. Then there's the birth of Ishmael. He receives the sign of circumcision. And then God promises Isaac. Then we see the birth of Isaac, the attempted sacrifice of Isaac. He buries Sarah, and he secures a wife for Isaac, and then he dies. So we see here, in a brief timeline, Abraham's life. One of these days, on a tombstone somewhere, will be your beginning date and your ending date. And the only thing in between those two dates is a dash. And that dash represents all of those major milestones that I just read to you. And somewhere, some preacher or some uh, uncle or aunt or someone who loved you will stand and give an eulogy, and they will talk about that dash in between to try to help other people that maybe didn't know you quite as well to understand who you were. So really, what it stands for is, what does that dash mean? Does it speak faith that I walked a faith walk? What does it mean? It's a mighty, mighty big dash. There are several covenants found in the Bible. Typically, we look at these seven, so I posted this one. Uh, specifically, we'll look down to the one at the era, the covenant Abraham. And it's referenced in Genesis 15 and 17, as I stated. God's promise there, Abraham's descendants would become a great nation if they obeyed God. God would be their God. So really, and we studied in Sunday school not too long ago, the sign was the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch that passed through. So that was the covenant. But if we look at it, a covenant was always an agreement, but it was something that God was responsible for. He was the one that could do it, but it took a willing heart. They had their part of the bargain to uphold. What were they to do? They must obey God. And we saw time and time and time again that Israel was just hard-headed. Seemed like they had a hard time learning the lesson. And they wandered, as we know, in the wilderness for 40 years. And if we're not careful, we'll do too much wandering in that dash between our dates. Too much wandering and not enough of clarity so that others that are depending on us to shine forth his light won't see the light of Christ because we are wandering in the wilderness. We want to play a little bit. We want to have a good time. We've worked hard. Uh, my daughter, when she got to 12th grade, you know, she was kind of letting things slip a little bit, and I said something to her, and she said, well, I've made it to the 12th grade, and I deserve a break. I'm going to have fun. Oh, yeah? Go get me your daddy's belt. We'll talk about some fun. I mean, I was about to tear up. I mean, this was her attitude, was it not? And so we, we had a little bit of a, a problem there for a little while. But if we're not careful as Christians, we look at the Israelites, 
wandering around in the wilderness, acting like a bunch of lost sheep, not knowing what to do. And they had the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had Moses to lead them. Uh, they had God to give them wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And, and he gave them everything they needed. And what did they do? They complained. I don't want manna today. You know, I don't want the same thing two days in a row. Can I get a witness? I don't do leftovers the very next day. And so, you know, that's the way they were. They looked at that man and said, I'm about sick of that mess. You know, and what we see here is, we see that as a people, we want to enjoy life. And I can promise you that if you'll hang with me the next few minutes, you're going to see what an incredible life we can have because of the covenant that God has made with us, his people. And so we see the people, the place, the presence, and the blessing, God's promise to Abraham. He says, I will establish a co my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. So he promised he would make him a great nation. He would make him fruitful. Well, what made Abraham special? He obeyed God. That will make us special. Genesis 12 and 4 says that after God called him, he went as the Lord had told him. Now, God told him to leave where he was, and that's really all he knew. He didn't know exactly where he was going. Now, I want you to picture, because mostly gentlemen are in here. And so, picture going into the tent and telling your wife, we're going to pack up and leave. And she's going to say, where are we going? I don't know. Well, what are we going to take? Everything. Well, how long are we going to stay there? I don't know. He had his hands full, saints. He had his hands full. But he obeyed God. And so as he spoke to him, I just believed that the Lord went before him to Sarah. And he prepared Sarah for what was about to take place. And so we see him in Hebrews listed as an example of faith several times and refers to this impressive act. Hebrews 11 and 8 says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. I heard a story this evening about uh, this um, gentleman, and he was a pastor, and his wife passed away, and uh, he preached the gospel, and he felt led of the Lord to get on the ship and come over to America and preach the gospel. And so his sister and his daughter came with him, and as they got on the boat, his daughter asked him, said, Daddy, what does that say? And he said, the Titanic. Well, we all know that story. And so, uh, but as the ship started going down, they said he began to run, screaming through there. He had on life jackets, him and the two that was on board with him, running through there, screaming and hollering, if you don't know Jesus, get a, li get a, a life uh, vest, get a life vest. And he was giving out the message and screaming and hollering and trying to tell them to take cover. And he got his uh, sister and his daughter on um, some sort of rescue thing and got them s established and situated. And then he, in his life vest, he began to paddle over to different ones hanging on to a piece of the ship. And he would say, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? If they knew Jesus, he moved on. He didn't stop. He kept going. He finally got up to one guy and he said, do you know Jesus? And the guy said, no, I don't. He pulled off his life vest and put it on him, said, here, you need it. And he drowned. He went down. Now, I'm telling you, this was a man convinced that if he could just get the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it would save their soul. We, too, need that kind of conviction. That's faith. Believing that if I can just get them 
to the message, if I can just get them to it, then God can save their soul and they can make heaven their home. It wasn't about saving his life. I thought when I first started hearing the story that he had on his life vest and, you know, he was doing okay. But what he was doing was he was looking for that one out of the 99. Amen? He was called of God. So God calls Abraham out of a pagan culture. Abraham knew and he recognized the call of God, the Lord, and he obeyed willingly, not hesitantly. And this is a key for us. If our faith is going to be strong, our obedience factor is going to be out the roof. We are going to be obedient because we know who we are obeying. Um, John Bevere said, Obedience is the outward evidence of the true fear of the Lord. And Brother Eric, you and I have talked about people today have lost the fear of the Lord. But this is a real, real thing. The fear of God isn't being afraid of Him. It's being afraid of being away from Him. Uh, it's knowing that old song that we used to sing, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. We don't want to walk without him because we know that road and we know how rough it is. We want to walk holding his hand. Another example of his life of faith is seen in the birth of his son Isaac. They were childless, yet Abraham believed the promise of God and that faith is credited to him as righteousness. This son was the heir of promise. This son was the fruit of faith. And I'm telling you, saints of God, when we have faith, fruit will follow. Amen? There will be fruit if we have faith. So righteousness is defined as acting in accord with divine or moral law, free from guilt or sin. You see, we can witness because we ain't carrying the load of sin. We know who we are serving. And so it makes us free as a bird. And we're willing and able to let his light shine because we're not carrying around all that baggage of sin. Abraham's faith in the promises of God was sufficient for God to declare him righteous in his sight, thereby proving the principle of Romans 3.28. So therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So Abraham did nothing to earn justification. His trust in God was enough. He didn't try to earn anything. He just simply trusted in God. He had that confidence. Now a test of faith. This son, this fruit of Abraham's faith became a test of faith. God commanded him to sacrifice his son on Mount Moriah. How did he act? We don't know what was going on inside of him, but what we do know is that we see him faithfully obeying God, who had been gracious and good to him thus far in his life. And I want to throw this mic down and stomp and shout right here, because if we can just but look and see Turn around and look at what he has saved you from. How many times has he delivered you? How many times has he met your need and given you exactly what you needed and a lot of times what you wanted? Amen? Can I get a witness? And so when we understand, if we can just but see what he's done for us, we'll be a whole lot more willing to step out there in the unknown and say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. It will define your faith for you. But we first have got to turn and look. I can testify to this. I can remember going up to Plymouth from Roper in a little old car. I don't know what kind of thing was. It was the ugliest green brown color you ever seen. But anyway, my little mama, that thing knocked off. And she guided it over to the side street. And we sit there a minute or so and I'm thinking, we're going to be late to church. And all of a sudden, my mama laid her little hand up there on that car. And she prayed a prayer over that thing. She reached up. She cranked that motor. We went to church, and we had church back then. We had church. 
And let me tell you something. If that doesn't start to build faith in a child, I don't know what does. On and on and on, I could give you these testimonies. Block by block by block, Brother Richard, it built a foundation for me. And now I can look back and I saw what he did yesterday. And you know what that does? It gives me a hunger to keep on keeping on because he can do more than we can even imagine or think. Exceedingly above all that we can even imagine. And so it will define our faith for us if we will allow it. But start with what has he done? He's done great things. So it builds up my faith that God is a God I can trust with all of me. He's not a man that will fail me, but he's God. And he's able. He's the creator of this world. And he can do anything in this world that I need. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. So what we see Abraham do is obey. We don't know what sort of war he might have had in his own mind. But what we do know is he obeyed God. He's waited decades for a son. And God prom promised, and God's promised child to him was about to be taken away. So what's the point here? Well, Abraham's faith in God was greater than his love for his son. And he trusted that even if he sacrificed Isaac, God would be able to raise him from the dead. So if he obeyed God, he knew that uh, all the other things that happened, it was all going to come out all right. Now, if you've run over there to Revelation to the back of the book, you see that we're on the winning side, and it's all going to be all right, Brother Aaron. We're going to make it to the other side. And so knowing that, we are able to obey, obey the Lord and do those things that he is calling us to do, to be the church. Amen? Amen. We know Abraham had his moments of failure. Two times he lied to protect himself. He tries to take matters in his own hands, and he had a child with Hagar. This child demonstrates the futility of Abraham's folly and lack of faith at that point. But it also demonstrates to us the grace of God. He allowed the birth and the blessing of Ishmael. So God gave Abraham a new name along with the covenant of circumcision and a renewed promise to give him a son with Sarah, a renewed promise. Indeed, all who put their faith in God through Jesus are counted as spiritual heirs. It tells us in Galatians 3 and 29, you are Abraham's heirs according to promise. So our lives should be so lived that when we reach the end of our days, our faith, just like Abraham's, will be an enduring legacy for those that follow us, that watch our life. And so what what we see there is a new name, a covenant with God, and a renewed promise. A renewed promise. The point here, the father of the faithful had his moments of doubt and disbelief. Yes, he was human, just like us. Yet he is still exalted among men as an example of a faithful life. So recap his life here. His life shows us the blessing of simple obedience. When asked to leave his family, he left. When asked to sacrifice Isaac, he rose early the next morning to do it. Father of the faithful. So from what we read, we find no hesitation in his obedience. He might have agonized, we don't know. But when it was time to act, he acted. You see, obedience is not optional. If we are disobedient to the Lord, we will have to clear that matter up before he can totally and fully use us for his perfect will. So we have got to be obedient or he can't use us. And we don't want to be in that relationship with him that is not step in step. We don't want to be a step behind him but we don't want to be a step ahead of him. And so we see that while Abraham was not a perfect man, he was the father of faith. He knew what obedience was all about. Chapter 2 taught us also that without faith, it's impossible to please him. 
For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we learn that without faith that we could not please him. Romans 12 and 3 says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Brother Eric, do you mind helping me out? And on Sundays, he's my right-hand guy in class. Can you do something for me? You, you understand how that thing works. All right. I want you to take that and I want you to measure how much faith you got. That's it. That is exactly the point. He can't measure it because he can't see it. But God gave every single one of us a measure of faith. So there we see Brother Eric demonstrated. How do you take it and wrap it? Where do you wrap it? What do you do? You can't see it. But I can tell you that others can. Others can see it. Because we either live it out or we don't. That, that's, that's the bottom line. Is it a gift? Romans 12 and 3, as God has apportioned to each person a measure of faith. Just as God has given grace to Paul and Roman Christians and has given gifts that differ, so also God has assigned to each person some measure of faith. And none of this provides them occasion for boasting because grace, gifts, and faith are gifts from God rather than something that they achieved on their own. So in 1 Corinthians 12, we find it listed as a spiritual gift. You can see there uh, where I've got it highlighted in the yellow. Now, this little gift has been up here, but no one has appropriated it yet. So unless someone was to come and take it and, and open it up and look and see what's in it, it does nobody any good. But I'm going to be nice and help you appropriate it, okay? Now what's up in that thing? Green is in that thing. So as we can see, something can just be there within our reach, within our touch, but unless we absolutely reach in there and pick it up and take it and appropriate it, it won't do any good. That should buy you a biscuit tomorrow morning. But, but, he could put it in his wallet and a week from now show me he still got it. Who knows? But it's what we do with the gift. The gift was there. It's been given. But are we going to water it and fertilize it and take care of it. What are the promises of God? There are many, many, many in Scripture. In each promise, God pledges that something will or will not be done or given or come to pass. These aren't flippant, casual promises like you and I would make. These promises of God are rock-solid, unequivocal commitments made by God Himself. Faith in the promises of God. So because God is faithful, the recipients of the divine promises can have full assurance that what God has pledged will indeed be realized. What God has pledged. God is not a man that he should lie. How many times have we heard pastor quote that? Has he spoken? Will he not do it? Numbers 23 and 19. So here are just a few of the promises that God made promises in the Old Testament. God promised to bless Abraham and through his descendants the whole world. This promise called the Abrahamic Covenant pointed to the coming Messiah for whom Abraham looked. God promised Israel to be their God to make them his people. And the Old Testament history is filled with examples of God fulfilling this promise. God promised if we search for him, We'll find him. He's not playing hard to get. Deuteronomy 4 and 7 says our God is near us whenever we pray to him. And God promised protection for his children. 
Psalm 121. He was the vigilant watchman over all Israel. He said, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip, but he watches over you, will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. He's God and he can fulfill this promise. God promised that his love would never fail us, 1 Chron Chronicles 16 and 34. And he's faithful in every way. God promised Israel that their sin could be forgiven, their prosperity restored, and their nation healed, 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. Repentance opened the road to fellowship and blessing. You remember the scripture, if my people shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. So God promised under the terms of the Mosaic Covenant prosperity to Israel for obedience and destruction for disobedience. And unfortunately, Israel eventually chose to disobey and the nation was destroyed by Assyria and Babylon. God promised blessing for all who will delight themselves in his word. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. So simple faith has its rewards. It says, oh, the joys of those who delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. Promises of God in the New Testament. So God promised salvation to all who believe in his son, Romans 1, 16 and 17. There's no greater blessing than the free gift of God's salvation. God promised that all things work out for good for his children. Romans 8 and 28. This is the broader picture that keeps us from being totally overwhelmed or dismayed by our present circumstances because we know that it works out for good. God promised comfort in our trials. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. He has a plan and one day we will be able to share the comfort we receive. So God promised new life in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Salvation is the beginning of a brand new existence. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So God promised every spiritual blessing in Christ. Whereas in the Old Testament, Israel had the promise of physical blessing, the church today has been promised spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms. 1 Peter 1 enforces our inheritance is reserved for us. God promised to finish the work he started in us. God does nothing in half measures. He started the work and he'll be sure to complete it. God promised peace when we pray. His peace is protection. It will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. God promised to supply our needs. Not that we get everything we want, but our needs will be taken care of. We are more valuable than the birds and our Heavenly Father feeds them. Now I've read you promises from the Old Testament. I've read you promises from the New Testament. I'm telling you that your heart should be pumping with joy and excitement because this is not mere man that has promised these things to us. It is our God, our Father, who promises us that He will be with us. He will go with us. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So now we look at the promises in the Gospels. Jesus promised rest. He says burdens are lifted at Calvary. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Jesus promised abundant life to those who follow him. That's in John 10 and 10. Following Jesus brings us more spiritual fulfillment than we could have anticipated. Let me tell you, we leave boring behind because we've got the promises of God that we're standing on. I came that they may have life and have it just enough to get by. No. Abundantly. Abundant life. 
Blessedness is what it's called in Psalm 1. It means to live abundantly. Jesus came that people could have abundant life. When fishermen worked all night and caught nothing, he gave them instructions that ended in a net breaking, boat sinking haul worth tens of thousands of dollars in today's economy. When the crowd he was teaching got hungry. He blessed and multiplied a little boy's lunch till everyone had eaten and there was 12 basketfuls left. When Peter was short on cash to pay taxes, Jesus provided a fishy miracle that paid the bill. Let me tell you something. What are you worried about, church? Why are you depressed? Why are you down and out? We've got joy unspeakable and full of glory because of his impossibilities to turning into possibilities for us through his sacrifice. Amen. He provided it all. And all we have to do is to listen to his voice and obey. Our faith builds step by step by step. Take a baby step starting tonight. Make up our minds that we have the ability to make it with Christ all the way across the finish line. I spoke to someone earlier tonight. I'm telling you right now that God will honor your decision to move forward in his direction. He is going to bless your heart because you have made up your mind to follow him. Can I get a witness? Hallelujah, hallelujah. To live abundantly means to be rich beyond measure. Abundance is extravagance, plenty, ac excess, more than enough. It's wave after wave of blessing and prosperity flooding into your life. Abundance is wealth, peak performance, optimum everything. Abundance has nothing, nothing to do with average, sufficient, adequate or median. I got that from Mitchell Toll. We all know that, you know, he's painted a, a little animal for some ball team and he, I, there ain't no telling how many millions he made on that. Uh, but the bottom line is this. We always, when we think about blessings, too many times the church world follows the secular world. We start counting the George Washingtons and the Abraham Lincolns that's in our wallet. No, he's not talking about money, although he will take care of you. But what he's talking about is a life of blessing. A life of blessing. I heard Catherine Kuhlman testify this week. And she said, young people, you can be mighty instruments for God. But I'm here to tell you there's a price to pay. And it's called obedience. Amen. We have to obey him to exercise our faith. Promise and provision is not limited to the spirit man while the mind is tormented and the body is sick and hungry. Poor teaching and weak living have ensured misunderstanding of this phrase, abundant living. Many conclude success is bad, money is evil, and living any part of the good life is a certain path to destruction. This kind of thinking presumes that the wealth and the riches of this world are reserved for the wicked, even though the Bible says the very opposite. God gives good gifts to his children. God is looking for somebody he can bless, and it might as well be you. Amen? So if we get in the word and we see if there's anything that we can do to become one of the blessed ones, he will honor that dedication to him. And if we do it out of the wrong motive, well, certainly we know what follows. But if we do it out of a heart full of love for him and wanting to get closer to him and in step with him, what an abundant supply pours down upon our lives. Jesus promised eternal life to those who trust him. The good shepherd also promised to hold us securely. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus promised his disciples power from on high. And in this power, they turned the world upside down. Jesus promised he would return for us. From then on, we will be with him always. These are promises that we can count on. These are, there are many more promises of God that could be listed. All of them, though, find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ, the radiance of God's glory. 
No matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Based on your relationship with Christ, can you say amen to these promises? Do they fill you with hope? Do they renew your faith? Well, that was the goal. One man's faith, George Mueller. Before I mention what the Lord did in this man's life, his background is that he was born in England in 1805 to 1898. This is a true story, and it's simply astonishing. He asked the Lord, If it be your will for me to start an orphanage for street kids, then I will only go to you in my prayers. He never had a fundraising campaign. He never went to churches and passed the bucket. He never advertised in bulletins or newspapers. He never went door to door. He never had drop boxes at stores. He's quoted as saying, only a life of prayer and meditation will render a vessel ready for the master's use. The Lord, through prayer, took care of 10,024 orphans, mostly homeless street kids in London. Established 117 Christian schools, educating over 120,000 children. One day they ran out of food. Oh, the staff was frustrated and they complained that it was time to let people know of their needs. He said, let us gather together in prayer. When they were done, there was a knock on the door. It was a vendor broke down in front of the orphanage. He had a heavy-duty wagon, and it was so heavily loaded with milk and bread, cheese and meat, that the axle broke. It would be half a day before he could get another wagon, and then everything would have gone to the bad. He couldn't think of a better place to donate it. Praise God, that orphanage is still up and running today using those same principles of prayer. That, my friend, is living by faith. What one man can do, he showed. Faith in God's promises. Where are you? If by faith you have received God's free gift of salvation, you have been snatched from the kingdom of darkness and placed in the kingdom of light. You've been released from the chains of Satan and his army and given eternal life, adopted as a beloved son or daughter into God's intimate family circle. You got here by placing your faith in Christ to save you, make you alive, and restore you. How much faith did it take to get you here? Well, who can say? I'll give you the measure. All we know, it was enough. You had enough to get here, a child of the living God. He saved you. So where is there? There is what you're moving into as you live out day by day. There is all the troubles, the trials, the opportunities, the challenges, the choices that God places before you on any given day. There can be pretty challenging, hard to bear, and your heart broken. There you can encounter mountains, run into brick walls and dead ends and disappointments. Find yourself in situations that seem way beyond your strength, wisdom or experience. It's a scary place. That place between Friday when he hung on the cross and Sunday when they knew he had rose. Saturday was a tough day. Amen. That's a scary place. Let's don't act like none of us ain't never been there. Like none of us ain't never had some discouraging, disgusting days to have to walk through. But your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, 1 Corinthians 2 and 5 says. Some say the reason you can't succeed there is you need more faith. Now, they, that's just what you need. You're going through the trials and the tribulations of life, but you just ain't got enough faith to get there. How much faith you reckon Lazarus had? He was dead. You encounter an obstacle, face a challenge, and you turn back thinking you don't have enough faith. So then you grieve because it's so hard to muster up more faith. So we tell ourselves, well, God can't really use me after all, unless somehow, somewhere, you could find more faith. I got, I, that, I got to just possibly find me some faith somewhere. Faith. We've been taught more faith, more faith, more faith. But don't lose heart. If you could get here by trusting in God for your salvation, 
you can certainly get there. If you can ask a holy God to come into your life, forgive you, and change your eternal destination on faith alone, and that's what it took, faith apart from any effort or works of your own. That's the greatest faith in all the world. You can do it, so don't lose heart. In other words, keep the faith. Greet each other with the words, keep the faith. Because you had enough to ask the Lord to come in and clean you up and make you His. Now you got enough faith to walk the walk, to stand before Him and ask Him on a regular basis to renew me and to restore me. Remember who you're asking. The two blind men called Jesus son of David. They knew who they were talking to and they knew what he was capable of. Recognition of his God-given authority to show them mercy that day. He had the power and authority to make a difference. They knew it and they know where to go to. You and I need to do the same thing. We need to remember where to go to. He has the power and the authority. But what is our part? Follow him and believe he can do it. How much faith does that take? Make sure you are walking in the faith you already have. Remember the story the father of a demon-possessed boy had brought his son to the followers of Jesus and they couldn't heal him and Jesus became angry. He said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Later, the disciples asked why they couldn't cast out the demon. Jesus told them, because of your unbelief. Now, what in the world is unbelief to a believer? It's when you become so weak and passive in the faith that you already have, you neglect or refuse to take the next step with it. In other words, you go backwards. You lose ground. You're not feeding it. You're not nurturing it. You're not guarding it. You're taking it for granted. Have you ever wondered why some people keep growing in their faith, others stay stuck or even backwards? It all comes down to foundations. We may need to fix a few cracks that may have happened in our journey of faith. Cracks, you know, prayers that you prayed, they weren't answered like you wanted them to, or they still haven't been answered yet. But I tell you, saint of God, all he tells us to do is to trust and obey. Keep on praying, keep on believing, putting your faith in him, because it comes down to whether or not you believe. We may need to fix those cracks. We may need to renew our response to the seed of faith that we've already been given. But it's time to expedite our spiritual growth. Expedite our spiritual growth. Don't stop. Never give up. Faith, like a muscle, only grows if you use it. A muscle that never gets moved or exercised shrinks and shrivels. And that's what happened to those disciples. You see, they had already experienced the power of Jesus surging in them in Matthew 10 and 1. It says, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. They had faith then. They had already experienced it. But seven chapters later, they had let that faith grow weak. They didn't need more faith to cast out the demon. They needed to return to what they'd left behind. They got to going so fast and so hard and so busy. What they had, they had left it behind. They didn't take care of it. The point, don't become weak. Don't retreat. Don't falter. Don't turn back. If you had faith once, don't let it drain away. Keep it strong. Go forward. Take the next step. Do the next thing. You don't lose faith. You lose the will to walk in your faith. Matthew 17 and 20, told, Jesus told his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing 
will be impossible to you. So it's not the amount of faith you have that matters. What matters is what we do with the faith that God has given us. What matters is putting the faith we have, great or small, in a big God, knowing he will keep all his promises and do what he has said he will do. And when we focus ourselves that way, yeah, we can look at mountains in our path and know that whether or not God moves them, our little mustard seed of faith in Jesus Christ will give us all we need to get through the situation. Any situation. Amen? Any situation. So put your faith in God. God calls us to have a faith that is completely, radically placed in Him and His Word. Putting your faith in Him will make a huge difference in your life and the lives of those that God brings into your world. How much faith do we need? What if you found out that you already have all you need? If he was strong enough to bring you here, well, then he's got enough to get you there. Amen? So no matter what, once we give our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ and we're walking in that faith, we just need to continue to walk and walk and walk. And as we get headed towards there, sufficient till today, every day he will give you what you need as you need it. What did we learn God's promises are not automatic. They have to be appropriated by faith. When we come into agreement with God's word by faith, we'll see his word established in our life. Sometimes God uses desperate circumstances to stir up our faith to believe for the impossible. So we don't have time for our discussion questions here. Sorry, I talk too much. But um, let us pray that our faith in God's promises are strong in our life so that others see that we not only say we believe, but we live out our faith and we do it through obedience to him. So when it's time to live out your faith, you will have that faith that you need. Building blocks are so critical right now for others that you're trying to mentor and train. And as Bugs Bunny would say, the end. I hope that you got something out of it, but I, I really believe. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. So the title of our lesson was Faith and God's Promises. God has given us promises. We can take that to the bank. We can absolutely believe he is a trustworthy God, worthy of our adoration and praise. Amen. Uh, Brother Eric, would you lead us to the Lord? I come here and fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Be fed by your word. Thank you for the teacher and the anointing you put on her. Ask Lord you would uh, help us to have faith, live by faith, that other people can see that faith. And help us to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And uh, help us to be good disciples because we might be the only. Bible that some people ever see. I say she'd give everybody travel and mercy as they go home and bring us back again the next time to, to this appointed place. Things ask in Jesus' name. Amen.